the state's endangered species program leader and was coordinated the Texas Nature Trackers, which is a citizen science program that includes Texas Amphibian Watch. And now she teaches science to homeschoolers and is involved in the conservation and development activities in Central Zimbabwe. But I'm sure that's not, not too much is happening right now. <laughs> but um, I'm turning it over to you, Leanne. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, I think I've probably talked to quite a few of you about amphibians before, maybe just in little pieces as part of the training for master naturalists. But this gives me a chance to bring in some of the information we did in more in-depth trainings when I worked for Texas Parks and Wildlife. And I also tried to think about uh, turning it so that it would be something that you guys could apply perhaps even in your own backyards, knowing that that was kind of the theme for this library series. So I'm a little bit new to Zoom as well, but we're all having to learn. So I'm going to switch over now and bring up my screen and we'll do a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but as Chris mentioned, if questions come up in your mind as I go, just write them down in chat and somebody will pull them all together at the end. All right, so here we go. I'm going to go ahead and share my computer sound because we're going to be listening to some frogs tonight as well as looking at them. All right, so um, what we're looking for is folks who are interested in doing what they can at any scale to help amphibian conservation. So I said we wanted friends of frogs. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how amphibians are um, environmental indicators and, and how you can you know, try to do everything you can for them. But let's start with a little bit of the biology. Um, of course, the word amphibian itself, uh, it comes from the word two lives. So these are vertebrate animals, one of the uh, several classes of vertebrates that you we're most familiar with in terms of animals, meaning they have a backbone. They are ectothermic or cold-blooded. Uh, their blood isn't always cold, but ecto, of course, means outside, and thermic refers to temperature. So the outside surroundings affect their temperature, and they have to use their surroundings in order to bring their bodies up to the correct operating temperature. So they have to go dormant at certain times when it's too cold or too hot, um, and they'll adjust their activity to try to compensate for that. So as I mentioned earlier, amphibian means two lives, and we think about that in a couple of ways. One is that they live part of their life usually in the water, and they have a very different larval form, at least the frogs do, than the adults. And so we have one life form living in the water. They go through a process called metamorphosis, and then they have a second form of their body in terms of the adult frogs at least, and they spend most of their time on land. There's some twists to how certain amphibians um, go with this, but this is sort of what they're named for. Uh, within amphibia, there are three different orders or kind of three different groupings. And so the first are the anura. Those are the frogs and toads. Um, a means without, and neura refers to the tail part of a body, so they don't have tails. The caudal fin on a fish, you may know, is the tail fin, and so caudata is the order that refers to the newts and salamanders um, and other things such as mud puppies and sirens um, that tend to have limbs as well as tails. And then finally, the order you're probably not as familiar with is gymnophonia. These are the Sicilians. They're strictly tropical in their distribution. They kind of look like an earthworm, um, but they're not. They're a vertebrate. Um, they spend a lot of time burrowed in uh, leaf litter, or some of them are aquatic, but they don't occur in Texas. So frogs live near water. But there are a lot of places where you can find water, and so there's a lot of diversity of habitat. We think about them in ponds and lakes especially, um, but rivers and streams, and then sometimes just wet places in grasslands or temporary pools that might form in a place such as here on Enchanted Rock, or even up in moist pockets in tropical vegetation like tropical rainforest. So a lot of variations on the marshes and the ponds that we typically think of for frogs. But basically, it's got to be some kind of habitat that's found near water. Two reasons for that. The first is, of course, their reproductive cycle that we already referred to. And the second is their permeable skin. So thinking about reproduction, we know that nearly all adult amphibians go to water to lay their eggs. 
This happens to be a species of toad, and toads are infamous for laying up to like 10,000 eggs at a time. So all these are little strings of toad eggs. So those, inside those eggs, there are larvae developing that are going to hatch out and be tadpoles, very different body form than the adults. The, the tadpoles are often grazers, whereas the adults are insect eaters. Well, those tadpoles continue to eat they start to resorb that tail, then they start to grow hind legs and then front legs. They're developing lungs at the same time. And so somehow they get from this small organism that's breathing with gills, strictly aquatic, into one that can come onto land and breathe with their lungs. At least part of their breathing is with lungs. And here's the other reason that amphibians have to be near water. And that is that they have this semi-permeable skin. Um, we know that other organisms are covered with things such as you know, uh, hair or feathers or scales or even insects have cuticles, but frogs have this smooth semi-permeable skin layer, uh, which means they can tend to dry out. But the other reason for staying wet is that they actually do a lot of their gas exchange through their skin. So they're using these small lungs to breathe, but they're also exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide through their mouth cavity and even through their outside skin. So when these kind of membranes are wet, you get a lot better gas exchange. So moisture, once again, is important for amphibians. Uh, taking a look at what the status is for amphibians, we, uh, it's, this is a number I found recently, 6,300 species of amphibians worldwide, but this number is actually adjusting all the time as new species continue to get discovered, especially in the tropics. However, the news for these 6,300 species isn't really good. Um, recent studies have shown that at least a third of the world's amphibian species are threatened with extinction. If you look at those that are uh, just declining, but perhaps not to that point yet, you're talking about 43% of amphibian species. Um, since 1980, nearly 170 species have gone extinct, and those are the ones we know about. So those are pretty sobering statistics, and it's more dramatic than the numbers for any other group of vertebrates. Um, so why is this happening to our friends, the frogs, and the other amphibians? Well, there are a lot of culprits, and a lot of them are ones you hear about quite a lot with all kinds of um, imperiled species. Habitat loss and fragmentation is a big one, of course, for many species. Um, so whether we're talking about loss of tropical rainforest or whether we're talking about the 50% of the wetlands in the uh, contiguous United States that we've lost, we have a lot of frog habitat, of course, that's being lost. A second reason is introduced species, and this is a common thread for a lot of other endangered species as well. Um, some examples actually include cases where other frogs are endangering amphibian species. So for example, this map shows that the eastern two-thirds of the country is like the native range for the American bullfrog. Uh, but it's a popular species. It's got big legs, it's good at winning frog jumping contests, and it's been introduced in many other locations. So all of this western part of the United States are introduced populations of bullfrogs. And in some cases, such as with the Chiricahua leopard frog in southeastern Arizona, bullfrogs have really caused declines in those populations. In other cases, it might be other introductions. So for example, widespread introduction of trout have caused some amphibian species to, go with, uh, um, to become imperiled as well, such as the mountain yellow-legged frog and introduced cutthroat trout. Um, but when we start thinking about things that are kind of unique to amphibians, we start thinking about that permeable skin again. And so pollution is one of the big um, issues that we worry about. We kind of think of amphibians as being a canary in a coal mine for us in terms of what's happening to the quality of the aquatic habitat. And so many, many things, for fertilizers, pesticides, heavy metals, acid rains, pharmaceuticals, in our waterways um, have been shown both in laboratory and in um, field observations to impact amphibian populations. For example, the popular pesticide, uh, pesticide atrazine, uh, which has been banned in many parts of the world, um, has been shown to impact the sexual status of frogs and toads. In fact, what it causes is a feminization of male frogs and toads. And so it, it, in enough doses, can actually cause a male to become a female. 
And so we may think that, well, isn't that good? But when those frogs go to breed, they actually have difficulty reproducing. And frogs are actually opposite than um, humans in that instead of XY chromosomes being males, the kind of XY or ZW chromosomes for them are the females. And so if everything switches um, to a female, then you, they can't reproduce the same number of males and females as the normal uh, ratios would be. Uh, there are a number, number of other um, substances that have been shown to affect tadpole feeding growth and survival and some others that affect um, neurological and immune systems. So we just think about them being pretty sensitive with that skin that can take in substances across it. Um, another interesting substance in the environment has led to a really bizarre case of um, uh, malformations for amphibians. And so this is something that kind of emerged in the 1990s when we were starting to both look at dramatic amphibian decline. And then we started seeing populations of frogs that had really strange development of limbs. Sometimes there would be webbing between limbs. Sometimes there would be extra limbs. Sometimes limbs would be missing. And so, um, of course, we thought this must be something that was, you know, really toxic, such as a pesticide. But in fact, um, we really think that what the patterns we've seen have shown us is that it's usually caused by trematode parasites. And these parasites of, um, kind of burrow into the frogs when they're just going through metamorphosis and starting to develop limbs. And so they affect the limb bud, and then you get all kinds of weird development of limbs. And so these parasites, though, are not just found in frogs. They're part of a life cycle that includes some snails as well. And we've observed that you can get really big booms of those snails when you have a lot of fertilizer runoff. So we're kind of back to looking at some kind of toxin or runoff in the environment. This is a picture of kind of the circle here. You've got these trematode parasites that are eggs that are picked up by snails. And then the snails produce a larval version of that uh, parasite. And that larval version then is the one that burrows into the frogs. Oops. And then um, then the frogs might be eaten by something like a bird, and then the, the bird, uh, then the larvae go ahead and develop into adults and uh, deposit eggs in the bird, and the bird then releases those eggs and feces, and the cycle starts over again. There's actually a really similar cycle that's happened with a parasite that has affected um, the fountain darter in the San Marcos River. Uh, snails are involved again in the in-between stage as an in-between host, and they discovered that night herons were actually another of the intermediate hosts in this life cycle. So really bizarre set of characteristics that arose from that, but tuned us into something that was really more of an indicator of the whole ecosystem health and the balance within those ecosystems. The real biggie, though, for amphibians is uh, chytrid fungus, uh, which causes a disease called uh, chytridiomycosis. Um, this is a fungal disease that can burrow into or can grow within the skin of amphibians. And it essentially sort of chokes off that skin of the amphibian, causing them to not be able to respire as well, causing them to be uh, not able to feed as well, and it's caused massive die-offs in many places for amphibian species. Um, we really began monitoring amphibians in Texas because we started hearing about these die-offs that were occurring around the world. And we have detected chytrid fungus in Texas, but we haven't really seen these kinds of die-offs. It appears that frogs in certain habitats are more susceptible, frogs at higher elevations, um, frogs um, kind of in cooler climates. And so it's affecting frogs in the tropics, but frogs at higher elevations. One species that um, is a victim of the chytrid fungus is this gastric brooding frog that was native to Australia. And it's thought now to be um, extinct in the wild. But this frog actually swallows its larvae because it lives in drier environments and the larvae develop within the stomach of the frog, and then the frog spits them back up. 
Um, and so people were wanting to study this frog to look at kind of the, the genes and the mechanisms that could trigger it to shut off production of gastric juices and um, host its larvae. And we don't have, unfortunately, that chance anymore. And then finally, there is some concern about changing climates for frogs and toads. In many parts of the world, especially where you have wet seasons and dry seasons, you have frogs that are kind of timed to the emergence of rains at certain times. And if those rains don't come or if the temperatures are off, then you might not get reproduction of the frogs. And if that happens enough, then you can um, actually see those populations plummet. Um, it can also stress frogs when you have these changes in climates. But um, the golden toad was a species found in mountainous areas in the cloud forest of Costa Rica. And it simply disappeared from the earth over a matter of like three seasons when the rains didn't come. And so, so it can be that quick if we have climate change that's causing changes in rainfall patterns. Well, you guys are probably already on board with this, that amphibians are important for a lot of reasons. And the reasons we care about those declines are, first of all, that amphibians are part of the ecosystems. They're an important part of the food chain. Sometimes in wetlands, amphibian biomass can be greater than that of fish, birds, or mammals, than any of the other vertebrates in certain kinds of um, wetland ecosystems. Um, they provide benefits to us. They, they're used widely in scientific research, um, laboratory animals, pregnancy tests. Um, in fact, we think that tetrid fungus probably got to North America from Africa through the African clawed frog, uh, the tracing down where it seems to occur naturally. It does occur in Africa, and the African clawed frog is used a lot in laboratory research as well as kept as a pet. Um, amphibians are sources of unique chemical compounds. If you've ever seen a dog pick up a toad and drop it and foam at the mouth, it just got a big taste of some alkaloids that we call bufo toxins. Bufo is the genus name for toads. And so those very powerful compounds, though, we know sometimes kind of open the door to uh, treatments that we didn't previously experience. So MD Anderson, is looking at toads for cancer-fighting properties, as well as dealing with heart disease and neurological uh, issues, and as well as some of these other sources of compounds that we've looked at, volatiles, natural adhesives, antibiotics. Um, and then within the ecosystem, amphibians have important roles in terms of uh, controlling insects and insect-borne diseases. That's where it gets back to us. So. It was estimated um, that the cricket frogs in one pond could consume nearly 5 million arthropods, mainly insects, spiders, that sort of thing, per year. And then finally, amphibians have a role in our culture um, and in ancient religions as well. Um, and they're widely eaten in some modern cultures. So a lot of reasons to care about amphibians. So what can you do? Well, there's, there are things that we can do to benefit amphibians um, here in our own area. Um, you probably got the message already that you would of course want to be careful in your use of pesticides, especially around aquatic habitats. You can create frog habitats in your yard and we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Um, as with many other organisms, such as songbirds, um, it's important to keep our dogs and cats from, you know, getting into the habit of preying upon um, wild animals, such as amphibians. Conserving water is an obvious one because of their need for aquatic habitats, um, and especially because here in Texas, we have several species that are tied to spring habitats. And then another way in which you yourself can get hands-on involved is to become familiar with frogs in our area and join some of the citizen science programs that are attempting to gather data on amphibians. So in terms of thinking about building some amphibian habitat in your yard, here's the good news is that they're, they're really very flexible in terms of finding a wet place and using it. In fact, after a good heavy rain, you'll find frogs breeding in all kinds of places, ditches and just uh, depressional areas and grasslands. But if you want to kind of some frogs around year round, 
um, you can build a frog pond. So some of the, the key characteristics that you want to think about if you're going to build a frog pond is to make sure there are shallow areas and sloping sides because you are dealing with amphibians that want to live in the water and on the land. So they need a way to exit the pond. Uh, provide a lot of hiding places. Vegetation is a great idea um, because you'll probably have to line the ponds. You can use pots for vegetation. And so this is actually uh, a pond that we built in our yard. We, we actually used a preformed plastic pond and set it into the ground um, and then kind of landscaped around it. Uh, these are some sedges that we collected from the wild. And these are some horsetail or equisetum that we collected from the wild. You can also use water lilies. I don't suggest cattails because cattails tend to want to really expand in habitats, but bulrushes and horsetails are really good choices. Um, if you really want to produce the most uh, amphibians, then you don't want to put fish in your pond. Um, but if you've got a lot of hiding places, I think you can strike a balance between both. And a lot of people love to especially put mosquito fish into ponds like this to help control mosquito larvae. Um, still water is best um, in terms of you don't need an aerator or a fountain going in here. But if you want to attract birds, we've actually got a little stream coming to ours so that birds will be more attracted to this running water. But there's enough quiet places around here that the frogs find plenty of good habitat as well. Let the frogs come on their own. Don't be tempted to order tadpoles and put them in there. Um, and especially don't go get frogs from the pet store and put them in there. Uh, they'll find it. And you want frogs that are native to your area and that don't come with the risk of disease that you could if you bought something from a dealer and then turned it loose here. Because what the frogs you put here may spread out and go many other places. Um, a lot of people are wondering, though, about putting the water in and having mosquitoes come. And uh, um, there have been a few studies that actually looked at exposing um, frogs to Bt, uh, the uh, bacteria that's used to control mosquito larvae, and it hasn't been shown to be harmful to frogs. So if you're comfortable with it in terms of other things, it seems to be safe for frogs. So just a couple of other photos. Here's a photo um, I found on the Boy Scout website, actually, of laying, um, if you want to dig out your own pond, then you just need to get a plastic liner to put into it, and then go ahead and um, kind of go ahead and fill in the bottom. Uh, you'll find some things will start to grow on their own, but it looks like they put some water lilies in here. You probably want a little bit more cover around for frogs, but, you know, if you build it, they will come. What we found, though, at our our pond, which is very small, is that the first frogs to show up were very small frogs, and then a little bit bigger frog showed up, and then there's not so many of the small frogs. And then a friend was telling me that ultimately what happened at their pond was that bullfrogs showed up, and that was the only frog they had. <laughs> but, but it's still amphibians, so you're doing, doing a good job of benefiting amphibians. Um, you can also benefit our amphibians that aren't quite as aquatic in terms of where they spend their time, and that is by setting up habitat for toads. So toads have a little bit drier, tougher skin that protects them a little more from drying out. And so you may know that they're pretty flexible in terms of burrowing themselves into things like flower pots when they're turned upright. Um, as well as other loose soil and protecting themselves from drying out even if they're not uh, close to water. But if you put some things like this toad house or any other kind of protected cavity that um, amphibians can get into, especially near a pond, you'll find that you're really providing a lot of other alternative habitat. So this is just a clay pot that somebody knocked a hole out of or perhaps you even find a broken one. You can embed it into the soil a little bit more so it stays even moister. These folks took the, the tray and put it on top and planted mosses, so they were really trying to create a natural looking toad house. But I've seen them all blinged up too, just so you can like glue some sparkly things on there. The toads don't care. They just are gonna go into something, as you know, that's wet and damp and dark. Um, in fact, I had an interesting call when I worked for Parks and Wildlife once. Somebody thought they had found some toads, they had opened up their water meter um, cover and they found some toads in there that were really pale colored and they were really 
uh, thin, thin limbs, and they thought they had some malformations. But so I drove up to Round Rock, I think it was, and took a look. And then I said, yeah, you know what? Actually, toads can't jump out of this um, this meter box. And so they had unfortunately just been in there a long time and were getting very thin. So, so anyway, toads will make their way into something that provides them some shelter from drying out and from the heat. Um, and use the remaining part of my time to kind of just share with you um, an introduction to some of the common frogs and toads that you would hear in our area. So we call it uh, frog watching, but it's actually really more like frog listening. Um, I've got a recording here that I actually made two nights ago here in our area in Wimberley because the, the rains we got really brought the frogs out. And this was made at a pond most of the year, but when we get heavy rain, the amphibians come. So let me just give you a sampling of a chorus calling here. Pigs Pond, it's April 6th, 2020, 10 p.m. It's rained about four inches in the last four days. Temperature is 69 degrees. Take a listen. So why do amphibians come out and do this? Well, what you're getting a taste of when you have an experience like going to a frog pond, like the one you heard before, that was at least four different species I heard calling. And there may have been others that just weren't loud enough to be heard over the den. But um, the reason that those frogs are singing is it's a love song. And so the male um, frogs and toads have a vocal pouch that they hold air in and they pass it over their vocal cords. And so this, this is a male Houston toad. And so under the right conditions, it happened one dark, warm, humid night. Um, some species like Houston toads will breed when temperatures are cooler. Others wait for it to warm up, but it usually involves darkness and moisture. And so then each species has its own unique call. So this is the call of the Houston toad. And so the purpose of that call is that the male is trying to tell females, hey, it's a great night, come on down to the pond. And so when the female arrives, she's bigger because she's carrying a ton of eggs if it's the right season. And so the male toad will um, try to grab onto a female. And then when she lays the eggs into the water, these are the black string of pearls that we see with toads. Um, the, the male will fertilize them in the water. And that whole life cycle that we saw earlier begins. Um, so within Texas, we have about 72 species of amphibians, and you can learn the the calls of all of them, um, or of the frogs and toads at least. Uh, 42 species of frogs and toads. Four species are threatened. Most of those are down in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Uh, one species in, is endangered, and that's the Houston toad that we just saw there in the previous slide. And one species has become extirpated. The northern leopard frog used to make it barely into Texas over in El Paso County, but hasn't been seen there for many years. And then the other species are um, salamanders. And I say about 30 species because a lot of work is still being done on the salamanders that are in our springs here in central Texas. Um, so at least six of those species are listed as threatened and two species are listed as endangered. Um, and so that would be the Texas blind salamander and then um, the, whoops, the, the other blind salamander, the Austin blind salamander. Um, so we're going to spend a little time, though. We could look at up to about 20 species that could occur here in central Texas. Um, but we're going to take a look just at the more common ones. These are species that you might very well hear right now. And um, so just give you a sense of if you make it out some nights um, that 
we're having good moist conditions, you might hear some of these calls. So the bullfrog, as we looked at earlier, occurs in most of Texas. Um, it's the largest frog in Texas. Uh, the body size is uh, three and a half to six inches, but then the legs can make it much longer. Um, Bullfrogs are usually found near permanent water bodies. They're a member of what we call the true frog family. The true frogs are in the family Ranidae, and they have these very long legs that make them great leapers and jumpers. Um, and so when we speak about frogs, not only are we speaking of these true frogs, but in general, any species that's usually found near water usually has the common name of frog. Whereas species that have sort of a, uh, are adapted to drier habitats, we usually call toad. And we'll see a couple of examples later. Um, so the bullfrog um, has got a big body and it's also got a big voice. Um, I'll play it for you here. Bullfrog, Rana Catesbyana. <laughs> So, uh, my bullfrog doesn't want to stop. So many people uh, say that um, they have kind. Of, it sounds like you're blowing over a large bottle, making that booming sound, like blowing over a bottle. And that's how I find it easy to remember frog names, is if you can picture kind of what it sounds like. And so some people say they say jug of rum. I don't hear it. It's, to me, it's like blowing over a bottle. So another member of this Ranadu family are the leopard frogs, or other members include the leopard frog. Uh, the northern leopard frog is not found in Texas anymore, but we have three other species that are found here. And so the southern leopard frog is a species that's typical of East Texas and coastal Texas. The plains leopard frog is not found here. It would be found up more in the Texas panhandle. And then the Rio Grande leopard frog we would also have here as well as the southern. And it's more of the South Texas, West Texas version of the leopard frog. Leopard frogs are called leopard frogs because they have spots. They also have this fold of skin along the body called the dorsolateral fold. And it is one way to tell these species apart. Um, in the Rio Grande leopard frog, it's like the plains leopard frog that you have this fold of skin that goes down the side of the body and then it stops and then it starts again a little more in closer to the backbone. That's how it looks on the Rio Grande leopard frog. The southern leopard frog has got a dorsolateral fold that just continues unbroken all the way down to the end of the body. You can also tell them apart by their voice. So as you might expect, the Rio Grande leopard frog um, or leopard frogs might kind of sound like a leopard, and that's what I think the Rio Grande leopard frog sounds like. It kind of, to me, sounds like it's growling or purring. Now the southern leopard frog is to me the, the ventriloquist or the, the perhaps um, imitator of all the other frogs. It makes a ton of different uh, calls and it's as if it's sort of sitting there trying to have a good time. Now the Rio Grande leopard frog will also sometimes do some grunts and squeaks and such, but the southern leopard frog chuckles and then proceeds to just add a lot of variety to the call, kind of some squeaks and And so if you remember Woody Woodpecker, I kind of think the, the Rio Grande leopard frog growls, but the southern leopard frog chuckles like Woody Woodpecker. Uh, we have a number of members of the tree frog family that you would find here. The green tree frog is really your typical looking tree frog, bright green with pads on the toes, excellent for climbing up things like cattails and blending right in in marshland habitats. They also have this white stripe along the face. I don't see green tree frogs in the hill country as much, but if you get into San Marcos and sort of imagine yourself being a, stepping a little more into the Blackland Prairie, then they're quite abundant, especially like at Ocarina Springs. So green tree frogs to me sound like they're kind of honking. 
area. If you want to think about green tree frogs as sounding like a duck or a goose, you know, I think that'll help you distinguish it from other things. Sometimes it's not such clear quonk. Sometimes tree frogs will sit in the tree and they'll just go rat, rat, rat. But still, it's kind of that same pattern for the green tree frog. Now, if you're in the hill country, it's much more likely for you to encounter one of the tr gray tree frog species. There are two species that look identical, um, and they kind of overlap in their range. They actually are just um, have different numbers of chromosomes than each other is what separates them as species. Um, the, the coax gray tree frog has half as many chromosomes as the gray tree frog, and so just something genetic happened along the way. But they can both be grayish or greenish. They can both kind of change their color depending upon their surroundings, the temperature, whether they're frightened or not. Um, and they just kind of look like lichens blending into a tree. They're calling abundantly right now. Mostly what I hear around here is the Cope's gray tree frog that has a little, they both make like a trill, but the Cope's gray tree frog is a little bit raspier trill, whereas the gray tree frog has a little bit more of a musical trill. And so let me play the Cope's gray tree frog first and then the gray tree frog. So just a little bit of difference in terms of musicality there. But you know, if you hear something with that short burst of a trill, it's probably a gray tree frog of some variety. And so that at least gets you started. Uh, this, this is a small frog that you always see along the edges of streams and ponds um, throughout most of the state, and especially here in the hill country. This is the cricket frog. Um, there's some, been some taxonomic work done that says that here in Central Texas, we have the Blanchard's cricket frog, and this is a different species over here. But basically, they're easily recognizable as cricket frogs if you notice that they're not very big, about an inch long. They kind of have a little bit of wartiness to their skin, not as much as toads, but there's a definite bumpiness, and that they're really good leapers. And so if you walk along the edge of a, uh, a stream or of a pond, you'll just see these little frogs just leaping out of the way, and that's probably a cricket frog. They're also really identifiable by the sound they make. People say it sounds like marbles clicking together. <laughs> So you've probably heard that if you've ever been along um, a river any time of day. You know, I, I describe these frogs as calling at night. You know, that is when most of the breeding takes place or when breeding takes place. It's a lot safer environment for the amphibians. But especially some of the tree frogs will call during the day, especially on an overcast day. And if you're down by the river and you take um, a couple of rocks and click them together, then you can sometimes get an answer from a cricket frog. Well, let's talk about a couple of toads now. This is the most common toad that you see around here, but Texas is rich in toads. Remember I mentioned earlier that usually when a species has the common name of toad, it's telling us something about how adapted they are to arid environments. And so Texas has got plenty of arid habitats and we've got lots of kinds of toad species. Um, including here in Hayes County, you would find several different toad species, but by far the most common one is going to be this one, the Gulf Coast toad. It's easily recognized once you know, I mean, a toad kind of looks like a toad, but once you know how to tell toads apart, this guy is easy. He's got the white stripe down the back, and toads are covered with these bumpy warts, and they also have these glands called paratoid glands that produce some of those toxins I talked about earlier. 
So the warts and these glands are producing toxins. They're not toxic to humans, but um, they certainly taste bad to predators. And so one way to tell a toad species from another is to look at the shape and size of these glands. So the Gulf Coast toad has got a triangular shaped gland. And even if you find a little toad that kind of is hard to recognize in terms of its coloring, um, you can look for that triangular shaped paratoid gland. And then in addition, Gulf Coast toads have these really prominent bony crests. So this is the toad that's in your flower pots. This is the toad that's on your back porch eating insects that come to the light. They're very adapted to you know, surviving in um, suburban and um, semi-urban environments and, and they're doing really well. Our other toad species in the county are not very common anymore. So if you find something that doesn't look like a Gulf Coast toad, then you, um, you might wanna take a picture and try to figure it out. Um, I mentioned that toads are adapted to arid environments. That even applies to their reproductive strategy. A bullfrog might lay eggs and it might take a year for those eggs to go ahead and develop into a tadpole and then metamorphose into a bullfrog. Toads are going to take advantage of temporary aquatic habitats that happen after big rains. And so they'll go through the life cycle much more quickly. The Gulf Coast toads uh, will go through that whole process of showing up, calling, laying eggs, and metamorphosing happening in like four to five weeks. And so I predict that four to five weeks from now, you are going to see a bunch of tiny little black toads hopping all over the ground because these guys are laying those 10,000 eggs then they're metamorphosing when they're still really small and you get these little black toadlets that are all over the place after that. So watch for it. I'm, I'm making it. Um, these guys are calling abundantly right now um, unless our temperatures cool off a lot and that can affect their activity. But if we keep some warm nights after these rains, you'll continue to hear this sound, a long, low rattle. And because these guys are designed to take advantage of, you know, this temporary water when it happens before it goes away, you don't just hear one, you hear a whole bunch. And so go out and, and try to see if you can. Um, this is another one we call a uh, toad, but then you can see that this is a very different looking animal. So this is in a different family, the narrow mouth toads. This is the Great Plains narrow mouth toad that just now started to call around here. Um, they are have a narrow mouth because they mainly eat ants and they have other adaptations that are meant for eating ants too. They have a fold of skin behind the eye that they can pull over the eyes to protect them from getting stung. They're made to burrow. You can see that they've got this streamlined shape to just go underground. But interestingly, narrow, Great Plains narrow mouth toads often share habitats with tarantulas. They will share a burrow with a tarantula. And we don't understand it fully, but it may be that the narrow mouth toad keeps ants and other insects from bothering the tarantula. And the tarantula kind of, you know, is bodyguard for this little toad. Um, so a kind of mutualistic relationship, perhaps. These guys don't begin to call until temperatures really sort of start to warm up in the spring. So those gray tree frogs and narrow mouth, I mean, and Gulf Coast toads, they might start calling mid-March, end of March, when the nights are just starting to warm. But Great Plains narrow mouth toads wait for heavy rain and they wait for the nights to kind of stay in the you know, upper 60s or 70s before they start calling. And so they have started calling this week. So they're a little toad, but they make a big sound. Let's listen. So we've heard short trills and we've heard long rattling trills and we've heard honking and we've heard marbles. Well, these guys sound like an angry insect to me. And so when you start to hear that ring at night, you know the Great Plains narrow mouth toads have come out. 
Well, there, those are probably the most common things. I want to throw in another couple of species that are just interesting. Uh, the Strecker's chorus frog actually can be quite common in the Wimberley area. But the reason I say that it's a little bit uh, different than the group we just talked about is this is a winter breeder. And so look at the breeding season here, November through April. So the physiology of this frog, it's a member of the tree frog family, um, is that it can be active in cooler temperatures. They're, it's hard to get to see one when they're calling, but if you do, they're really recognizable because they have this dark stripe through the eye and this kind of football player patch underneath. But just recently, I was hearing these guys call throughout most of March, and then when we started hearing the Great Plains narrow mouth toads, I stopped hearing the Strecker's chorus frogs. They may come back. I think it's supposed to be cooler again this weekend. Uh, but when they do, what you want to listen for is kind of a little bell or a little whistle going toot, toot, toot. Just kind of a clear bell-like sound that um, you can hear. Not always that fast, that may depend upon temperature, but just kind of a clear ringing sound. And they too will breed after rain makes all of these new little non-permanent uh, wetland areas. All right, and then there's some frogs that break the rules. These are the chirping frogs, but they're so interesting to learn about because you can hear them in some unexpected places. Um, the cliff chirping frog is a member of the tropical frog family, and that's the, the largest family of frogs in the world, actually. There are a bunch of uh, them, of course, in Central and South America. There are many of the frogs you hear about that breed within the trees, and then their larvae drop into the wetlands. And, well, our cliff chirping frog has got a little twist on that story as well. As you can imagine, they live in rocky cliff areas which means Wimberley is a great habitat, including if you have a stone house. They'll find a little niche to get back in, and then they will find a little moist place. And they will actually call from back in those crevices, and the female goes to the male, and they will actually lay their eggs inside those crevices, just where there's a little pocket of moisture. Instead of 10,000 strings of eggs in a pond, they lay about a dozen, and the eggs are large in size, and actually the tadpoles go through their metamorphosis in the eggs. And when they come out, there is plenty of moisture in the eggs for them to finish that development, and when they come out, they're just little frogs. So they're breaking the rules. They didn't go to water to lay their eggs, but really interesting because of the habitat we've got for them around here. So the chirping refers to the sounds they make a little kind of single chirp, and then sometimes a short little trill. So I think my recording here has mostly got the little trill of the cliff chirping frog. So, Listen for that around your houses in Wimberley. There's another species in the same family that's actually showed up here in the Texas, um, in central Texas area. This is the Rio Grande chirping frog, and it originally was native to the lower Rio Grande Valley. But this frog, instead of breeding in cliffs and crevices, they lay their eggs like in pockets of moisture in tropical plants or in soil pockets of moisture. And so what we discovered was that this frog, soon it we knew it was in the valley, but it started showing up. It showed up in Houston, and it showed up in Dallas, and it showed up in San Antonio, and it showed up in Austin. And so we think it got moved around with the tropical plant trade. And so now it's very ubiquitous in, in those counties and in the surrounding areas. I think once it jumped over the wild horse desert of South Texas, it found a lot of good habitat. And so people will find this frog just around their houses calling from vegetation. Um, and it's smaller than the cliff chirping frog, and it's kind of darker and less interesting in its color pattern. But it's so cool to walk around some places and just hear the little chirp of this frog coming from shrubbery and flower beds. So 
So people have described their call as sounding bird-like, but there's no bird that really makes that kind of sound at night. So you start hearing that chirp, and, and it's probably one of the species of chirping frogs. Um, so very interesting to just be on the lookout for. So, you know, I, I know you're all going to be experts after tonight's overview of the species you're most likely to run into here. But if you need a little refresher, I've got a couple of suggestions for you. Uh, one is that Texas Parks and Wildlife has a page where they have images of all the Texas frog and, frogs and toads, and you can click, click on them and play the calls. And so it's a good way to, to really quickly check for you yourself if uh, you remember what that call sounds like. And so if you just want to be sure to include Texas Parks and Wildlife and uh, Frogs and Toads of Texas or Herps of Texas or Frog Calls, you'll get to this page. If you're interested in having a resource more at your fingertip, this is a, a book that I regularly recommend called The Frogs and Toads of North America. Um, the author is Lang Elliott, who is actually a bio acoustician who goes around recording wildlife sounds and so this has got all of the frogs and toads of North America in it beautiful beautiful photos and it comes with a CD of all their sounds so I all people who've been to some of my other workshops know that I call it my coffee table frog book because it's got beautiful photos and you just want to put it out for everyone to be able to appreciate. So those are the, the top two recommendations I have in terms of learning your frog and toad calls. Of course, any kind of um, herp field guide would, reptile and amphibian field guide would help you, you know, recognize what they might look like, but these two resources can help you with the call. And then, once you've decided you want to go out and listen to frogs and toads, well, then you need to share that data. That's the whole reason we started Texas Amphibian Watch, was we were in that time period when people were going, what's happening to amphibians around the world, and is it going to happen to our frogs and toads in Texas? And we needed to develop this baseline to understand what we still have and, and recognize trends when those are happening. And so you have a couple of options of making your observations very useful. The first is many of you may have explored the platform called iNaturalist, where you can upload photos of plants and animals in the wild. You can propose an identification and other people will help you with that identification. Um, you provide a location, you provide a date. It's helping us learn a lot about the chronology of, and phenology of what plants and animals are doing at different seasons and where they're occurring. But you can also upload sound files. So I regularly use my voice recorder when I'm out in the field, just save that as a sound file. And then I have discovered that even though iNaturalist has this really cool app for both Android and iPhone, I have discovered that I have to go ahead and log into iNaturalist on the computer to upload my sound files. But it's a great way to share your data. And if you aren't sure what it is, others will chime in and help you out with it. Um, the other monitoring method that I think has a lot of value in and of itself, too, is Frog Watch USA. This is actually coordinated by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or Aquaria. And so it, it, the zoos are really investing a lot in amphibian conservation now. It's, a, it's really interesting to read about some of the work zoos are doing to try to save some of these frogs and toads in Central and South America that are threatened by chytrid fungus. And I encourage you to look up some of the, the work that's going on in places like Panama. But the zoos are also trying to invest in making sure that amphibians are doing okay here in our country. And so Frog Watch USA is based upon a system of where you actually adopt a certain wetland site that's going to be your frog pond and they have a certain sampling season that starts in the late winter. So we could hear those Strecker's Chorus frogs, or if you were in Bastrop County, you might hear Houston toads, and takes you through the spring and the, and the summer so that you can pick up all the different species of frogs and toads that might breed in your area. Um, so it's got a regular protocol. You listen for a certain specified period of time. You assign a scale to how many you hear of each species calling, and then you submit the data online. So if you look up Frog Watch USA, you can find out if any of our zoos in Texas are doing training workshops, or you can go through an online training um, there on the computer as well. So I encourage you, uh, you know, it's wonderful to learn about this for yourself, but 
share your data with others. And I guess that brings us to the end of what I had to share tonight. Hopefully we've got a little bit of time before, whoops, we're right up at seven, but Chris, if we had any questions, I'm happy to stay and answer. I'm get, I got one question from Shannon. She says, we have the narrow mouth and go, and whoops, now I anticipate here. We have the narrow mouth and Gulf Coast in our, in our pond. I he we hear the narrow mouth because it is so loud, but can't find it. Any suggestions? Uh, yeah, they're really infamous for that. And I think that perhaps it's even a strategy that the way these vocalizations are made is designed to throw predators off their track. And I find that narrow mouths are very hard to track down. Um, and they will also sometimes get themselves like almost half burrowed in, in the mud at the edge of the pond and call from there. And so, yeah, um, I don't have any secrets to it. <laughs> Maybe um, have somebody listen with you and see if you can triangulate on the sound. I have a question while we're here. Um, it, um, I have a swimming pool and I find Gulf Coast toads occasionally in my pool. Sometimes they're still alive and sometimes I guess the salt water has, it's a salt water pool has gotten to them. Is there anything I can do to keep them out of there? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Give them another pool. <laughs> well, actually, actually, Fill the frog pond, maybe. <laughs> no, actually, that's what happened. I was doing a, an experiment uh, growing riparian plants, and so I had water outside uh, yeah. my pool, and I've actually yeah. had less since I started that. So you're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's tough to build a barrier that could keep everything like that out. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess that's my best suggestion is go with some alternative healthy habitat. Yeah. But it is quite common. You could give them a little ladder, let them get out. <laughs> well, I was wondering if they, if, they, if they do make those kind of things. I was going to Google it. <laughs> anyway, oh, I got another question. Are garlic-based mosquito bit and dunks okay for, fro for frog ponds? You know, I'm not familiar with those. I, my tendency would be to say that they, they should be. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Perhaps just try looking that up online and see if you find any recommendations. I specifically had wanted to look up what we knew about BT now. Um, but, but yeah, I, 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 my suspicion is it wouldn't be, but perhaps maybe take a look around and see what people say. Okay. Do we, does anybody else have a question or else? I have two, two messages for you. One from Suzanne Davis who says, bravo. And one from Peggy Wolfong that says, not a question, just a huge thanks for this fantastic presentation. And I'd like to thank you too for taking this on oh. and being our first guinea pig. <laughs> I, think this is, I think this is for you as well, Chris, <laughs> and for all of those who helped put it together, Betsy and Susan and everyone. <laughs> all right, well, thanks everyone. I've enjoyed getting together with you. Um, take care. It's safe to go listen to frogs, I can tell